Um, yeah, so today I will uh, talk about the uh, structural controls on high grade shear zone hosted zinc lead mineralization at the Duga River mine, Mount Isa in Laya. Uh, so, this is part of my PhD funded by MMG and my scholarship through James Cook University with support from EGRU. So, I'll get into it then. Um, change. Is it changing? No, it hasn't changed. Oh, there we go. Oh, sorry okay. about that. So as a quick overview, in this presentation, I'll focus on the uh, structural framework that led to the uh, formation of the Dugal River deposit. Um, so I'll also give a brief introduction to the uh, deposit and the regional geology. And this presentation is based off a paper that we're almost ready to submit. So the uh, figures presented are still a work in progress. So uh, Dugal River is situated in the Mary Kathleen domain of the Mount Isa in Laya, around uh, 65 kilometers northwest of Plankari. Oh, sorry. Uh, so it's a world-class, or considered a world-class deposit with 60. 7 million tons of resource at 11.6% uh, zinc, 1.2% lead, and 25 grams per ton silver. Right. So I won't go into too much detail about the regional geology, but Dugal River is situated in what's called the uh, Mount Rosby High Strain Corridor, um, which is bounded by the Mount Rosby Fault to the east and the Kalula Fault to the, to the west. So the uh, corridor comprises the Mount Albert group of the Culvert Superbasin um, with the host rocks to the deposit, the Mount Rosby Schist dated at uh, 18, uh, 1686 MA. Um, the Dugal River Shale member, the, the purple layer over there is part of the Mount Rosby Schist. Uh, the rocks were subjected to the Eisen orogeny, which is initial north-south directed shortening followed by a further three with a general east-west uh, direction. Uh, so jumping straight into the structures. So D1 is the first deformation event. Um, it's inferred to be north-south directed and is largely overprinted by later events, mainly the uh, coplanar D2 and D4 events. So ZU during studies in the 90s recognized type one interference folding, uh, Ramsey interference folding between F1 and F2 to the south of the mine. So these are a little bit harder to spot on the ground due to the intense shearing that occurred later. However, um, S1, is, uh, S1 is commonly observed within the D2-related pyroblasts. Uh, so they're aligned parallel to the S2 foliation, so the red dashed lines, and then the inclusion trails within the pyroblasts, the S1. So the green dashed lines is S3, which I'll go into a little bit later. Um, then going on to the D2 structures, uh, it is the dominant uh, fabric in the Mount Isa, um, ductile fabric rather, and it's generally a north-south trending fabric. Uh, so at Dugald River, it's comprised of multi-scale tight to isoclinal F2 with an associated F actual planar cleavage. The uh, folds are also associated with quartz carbonate veining that form through various space accommodating me mechanisms such as uh, flexural slip, actual plane normal extension and where the folds start to tighten in separation and concurrent limb attenuation occurred. And then also boudinage um, where the folds are tight. Then D3 was first recognized by Zoo in the 90s. Um, so it developed a weak crenellation cleavage, the green lines on the thin section. Um, and Zoo also describes sub-horizontal actual plane F3. Um, so D3 is inferred to be a, or a period of orogenic collapse where the principal stress direction was subvertical and to states that they are a stop to the east uh, sense of shear, which locally rotated S0 and S2 to moderate west dips. Then looking at the D4 structures, um, so D4 marks the development of a north-south trending and osmosing shear system during dextral transpression. The discrete shears are curvy planar and you find pods of up to meter scale SC prime fabric. 
then the asymmetry of the SC prime uh, sigmoidal lenses suggests top to the northeast censorship in a dextral um, transgressional regime. So, and then lastly, the uh, shear system has developed high and low strain domains resulting in transposed fabric and um, preserved pairs of F2 folds. So here's a good example from a drone image to the north of the mine. And then lastly, the final major event um, recognized at Dougal River is the reactivation of earlier fabric, mainly the shears. Uh, this resulted in development of fault rocks. And because you have the presence of both cohesive and incohesive versions of breaches and cataclasites, it suggests active faulting to shallow crustal levels. So there's a lot in this image, but the main thing to point out is the cataclastic fault core. So this is the, the main shear. So sorry, that's a rotated image from, from that. Um, so this is the main shear at the mine, and it goes from one side of the drive, we have a fairly thick high strain zone to the other side of the drive, so five meters apart, um, we have quite a narrow cataclastic fault core. Um, so when we look at the shear zone geometry, um, what stands out the most is the fact that you have a wide range of west dips um, from 40 to 90 degrees. Um, with localized east steps in, in the north. Uh, this, this effect is largely due to the um, effects of D3, which I'll explain in the following slide. And then the flatter part of the shear zone is also associated with um, thicker ore and higher grade, particularly the matrix supported breccia as shown in the image over here. Uh, so here the matrix is mainly stellarite with cloths of rounded pyrite um, quartz fluorite and, and host rock. So when we look at the mineralization phases, so we infer that there are two mineralization phases separated by, by D3. So the first phase is related to progressive fold tightening during D2. So here the space accommodating veins are progressively rotated into parallelism with S2. Uh, so the uh, tighter folds um, results in additional space accommodating features such as hinge separation and attenuation um, and wooden eyes along the limbs. So what this results in is veins linking up to form isolated fold hinges, um, almost resembling a crackle brexia. So V sulfide is also replacive and increases towards what is laid to the shear zone. Um, so in other words, uh, we have tight folds with interlinked sulfide veins created a favorable site for strain partitioning and development of the Dubu River shear zone. Um, yeah, so D3 is associated with the development of a subtle S3 cleavage, which for the most part is fairly spaced, um, except for in the South Mine, where zones of S3 intensification has occurred. So these zones of intensification has locally rotated S0 and S2 and were reactivated early during D4 to create low angle thrust and the flexure observed in the shear zone. So in addition, um, opposing shear directions along steep S0 and S2 planes and moderate S3 created extensional sites. And this creates an excellent fluid trap, hence the high grade mineralization in the south line. So phase one on its own would not have been economical. Um, so phase two saw the significant enrichment of the deposit through mobilization and remobilization of sulfides. Uh, and notably the peak conditions were in the range for ductile deformation of the sulfides and brittle deformation of the host rock. So while the style of mineralization, sorry, the style of mineralization during phase two is dependent on the geometry of the shear zone, so in the north mine, which is depicted over here, the shear zone is steep west stepping and parallel to the D2 fabric. Thus, uh, transposition of the host rock and sulfide veins do are dominant. Um, so the, the tight folds undergo fold uh, further amplification and attenuation along limbs with migration of sulfides and eventually resulting in a transposed fabric of pseudo layering. So there's a lot more to this figure, but that's probably for a different presentation. Then lastly, when you look at the South Mine, um, it has a flatter shear geometry. So while uh, transposition has locally occurred along localized steep shears, the dominant mineralization style here is one of combined mobilization and remobilization. 
specifically mechanical remobilization to form the matrix pressure with this rounded class. Um, so in conclusion, Duba River has been subjected to several deformation events and co, co and progressive deformation during D2 and D4 provided favorable extensional sites for mineralization of mineralizing fluid, fluids. So phase one on its own would not have been economical and phase three through a process of mobilization and remobilization resulted in significant enrichment of the deposit with grades governed by the attitude of the shear zone. And notably earlier D4 reactivation of D3 fabric resulted in large scale dilational jog in the shear zone. All right, thank you. So there's just a couple of references from the, the presentation. Thanks, Peter. That was great. I think Karen was going to call with next questions. And yeah. thanks, Helen. I was still on mute as I started to uh, to try and talk. Um, Peter, do you want to stop uh, sharing your screen and then we can come back on screen? Um, I'll just see if we have. Uh, so it doesn't look like we have any. Oh, we do have a question coming in here in the in the Q and A from Lucy Chapman. What are the PT conditions specifically and, and how are they determined? Uh, so you probably got me there. So I don't have the exact numbers, but it would have probably been in the range of 200 to 500 degrees Celsius. Um, Cause at that temperature, your, your sulfides are ductile. Okay. And yeah, Lucy so just, it's, yep. it's probably for another study. Um, my focus was mainly looking at the mine scale, um, you know, structures for the mineralization. Uh, and, and Lucy also said thanks <laughs> and corrected me for, for missing that out. Um, so, uh, sorry, I had to step out for uh, a second and, and sort out my dog. But um, so just to clarify, the main stage of mineralization is during regional D2 or the main regional north-south deformation? Um, no, it would be during D4 because that creates your extensional side. So through the shearing, you've created a number of dilational jogs within the shear zone. Um, and okay. also mobilization, which means that with the shear zone, it's created a channel way for any fluids from the basement or wherever to move along. And because you have this impermeable slate lay between the, you know, it's in, within the slate rather, um, okay. once it finds an extensional site, it will just move towards the areas of low mean rock stress. Okay, so there was some sulfite that came in in your diagram of the veining and the intensification of the veining on those F2 folds. So there's some sulfites that come in or it's really just the, the quartz, no, you know, the so, host veins at that stage? No, so during D2, you also had uh, sulfide replacement of quartz carbonate veins. Um, so when you resume your um, east space compression during D4, what tends to happen is you have strain softening along the sulfide horizon and you know, all the strain just gets focused within that and it's created a shear zone. And along the shear zone, you've had more fluid um, running along it. And also remobilization of any sulfides within the host rock into these uh, low areas of low mean rock stress. Okay, so, and John Menzies has a, a <clears throat> related follow-up question. Uh, what percentage of mineralization was introduced during phase one? the earlier stage any oh, we have no clue sorry okay okay but there was there was introduction of additional sulfides or just remobilization during the main d4 stage do you have a feel for that um both so oh, okay it's it, any sulfides that was in the host rock has been concentrated through remobilization so that's what creates those little rounded glass so it anneals i think it's called um rolls the like the competent rock, so the pyrite, the quartz, um, you know, the host rock, whatever else is competent and rolls it around within the sulfide fluid matrix, basically. Yeah. Okay, thanks.